If you've ever found yourself choosing between the mobility of mirrorless video and the functionality of a cinema camera, then the Sony FX3 aims to be that very Goldilocks camera that you're seeking. Oh, if it were only so simple. Yes, the FX3 is a brilliant little camera that wedges itself between the FX6 and the A7S3, and I can say that after spending a couple weeks with this camera, I finally have a handle, see what I did there, on who this camera is for and how it doesn't really cannibalize either of its sister products. So, let's go. This camera is 100% an A7S III in a cinema-focused body. Losing the EVF, adding a handle and pro audio interface, and moving around buttons and switches to make more sense for video shooting, the FX3 aims to make mirrorless video a much more effortless process without the size and price tag of the FX6. As you probably already know, this camera was leaked ahead of launch and a lot of commenters online were accusing Sony of trying to squeeze every last little bit of money out of their demographic. And to be honest, when I first saw this camera, I kind of thought the same thing. But now, after using it for a while, I really do see that it does fit a bit of a gap in Sony's lineup. I brought this camera on a shoot and spent two weeks testing every element. So let's go through my wins and challenges and where this camera lands when compared to the A7S III and the FX6. If you've watched more than one video on this channel, you're probably already familiar with how much I've griped about shooting professional video on mirrorless cameras. It's something that I generally detest doing. Keep in mind that even though still cameras have evolved to shoot really incredible video, they're still very much designed as still photography cameras. Outside of the FX3, only the Sigma FP and the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema cameras have gone to a video focused design in a small mirrorless compact body. And they are still, to be perfectly honest, far from perfect. And if you want to know what I mean by that, a little write up in the description below where I elaborate. But the FX3, with or without the handle, is notably much easier to use than the A7S III, unless you want to take a photo. More on that later. My favorite aspect of the FX3 over the A7S III is the button layout. I love how you don't have to navigate around an EVF to access a menu. I don't know why this is such a big deal to me, but as a right-hander, I never really liked this about Sony cameras, putting the menu button in quite possibly the most awkward location. Unless you're left-handed. In which case, lefties, you're living in a right-handed world. Sony has also added a zoom rocker when using their cine zooms with electronic zoom control. You can also, with any other lens, use clear image or digital zoom. However, one small critique here. The rocker cannot be assigned to anything beyond optical or digital zoom. It's zoom or nothing. There are no options to disable this, and I found myself bumping it often. If it's set to optical zoom, then a full screen warning comes up on the screen, requiring you to always have to click out of it. If I was to hazard a guess, I'd say that maybe 5% of FX3 users are going to be using Sony's electronic servo zooms. And so for that reason, I feel like not being able to disable this is a little disappointing. And I've suggested as much to the Sony engineers that this might be something they wanna consider for future firmware. The next win are the very obvious tally lights. I can't tell you how often I think I'm rolling when I'm not. If this has never happened to you, then you probably just haven't shot enough. I love the nice big record button and how basically the whole camera lights up so there's absolutely no mistaking if you are recording or not. Another win is the cage-free design. Now certainly cages will be made for this camera, but you can pretty much go without one. Five on the body, or when you add a handle, you bump that up to six. Now, the handle is plastic, which makes me a little hesitant to place heavy items on it or crank it down really hard, but it's plenty strong enough for monitors and the sort. However, two really important points here. The first one being that this quarter 20 is right next to the HDMI flap. So if you're using the HDMI and you wanna use that quarter 20, then you probably gotta find a way to take off this little flap somehow. Except that I couldn't figure out if it's actually removable by the user. And I wasn't about to break the only copy of this camera in the country. The second note is on the audio module part of the handle, there's no cold or hot shoe. And this is the most logical place to put a mic pack. Even adding a secondary cold shoe isn't a solution because placing it on the handle takes away the use of the handle, and any other place just gets in the way of critical functions. Since we're on the topic of audio, this is another big win for this camera. The handle is basically fused to the Sony's already existing XLR K3M audio interface. This gives you four channels of audio, pro dial control, phantom power, and a range of audio ports like XLR, quarter inch patch cable, and of course, 3.5 audio. Additionally, you get access to 24-bit audio over 16-bit for improved audio quality overall. There are, of course, a couple things that you should know. For most people, this will only give you three channels, in the sense that the 3.5 port is pushed into tracks three and four. So if you want to separate the tracks, you'll need some type of splitter to send one signal to the left and the other to the right. 
Number two is if you plug anything into the 3.5 jack on the body, it defaults back to the two channels with the sole audio being whatever you've just plugged in. Number three, the switch on the back of the audio module is a little confusing. And all this really means is what do you want tracks one and two to be? But regardless of what you select, all four channels are being recorded. And finally, the FX3 will only send out two channels of audio to an external recorder. However, you can select which two of the four channels to send to the HDMI feed. Ideally, what I'd like to see is the camera's scratch audio assigned to the fourth channel. Now, I'm not sure if they can or will do this, but that makes a whole lot more sense to me. Now, if you are already an A7S III user, you can get just the K3M module separately, but it's gonna cost you an extra 800 bucks, whereas this whole thing is included with the price of the FX3. One other little quirk as well, if you are using the FX3 as a B cam to the FX6, just note that the audio channels, the XLRs, are one and two on the FX6 and then one and two on the FX3. That caused me a lot of confusion when I was plugging stuff into here because I was used to this. Take note. Now let's talk about the image. Everything you've ever seen about the A7S III, you can apply to this camera. Nothing has changed with the exception of a new cooling fan on the FX3, which means that you can record 4K 60p nearly indefinitely. This camera comes equipped with a Cinetone, which was previously only found on their other FX cameras. The question I had is, is S Cinetone on the FX3 an exact match for the S Cinetone on the FX6? And by that I mean, if you were to use the FX3 as a B cam to the FX6 or FX9, would it be a seamless match? The short answer is, not quite. It does not appear to be an exact match, but it's close enough that if left ungraded, most viewers wouldn't notice. Looking at the two images side by side, you can clearly see that there is a difference in the gamma curve, especially in the highlights. Back home, I tested this again with my own face, getting essentially the same results. Make no mistake, this is pure pixel peeping. In the real world, these cameras are a very close match, and even Sony's own engineer said it's really impossible to assess image quality outside of a controlled lab setting. I couldn't agree more, so keep that in mind. That being said, if you shoot with these cameras multiple times in multiple situations, and you keep seeing the same thing, then I'm going to stick my neck out and say, they're not the same. So I tested both against a chart, and the charts tell us two things. The FX3 exposes one stop brighter than the FX6, or you could say that the FX6 is one stop darker. This is also something that might change in future firmware. Keep in mind, I'm using a pre-production camera. The second thing is that the FX6 seems to be fractionally more accurate throughout the curve. But if you were a stickler for getting the best image, the FX6 time and time again showed me that it appears to have better gamma and image processing over the FX3 or the A7S III, despite the bitrate being exact. Even when looking at the S-Log3 image, we get a better curve out of the FX6. To me, it looks like they are all taken from the exact same camera, but the FX6 had a 1 8th black ProMist filter added or a 1 8th Ultracon. Regardless, image quality isn't going to be the defining reason why you choose an FX6 over an FX3, but it certainly helps the case for the FX6. I also feel compelled to mention as well that a camera can't light for you or frame a shot for you, which has infinitely greater effect on the image quality than the camera you're shooting on. The next test for me was rolling shutter. Does the FX6 processor have more power to reduce the rolling shutter effect? To me, I see no perceivable difference between the FX3 and the FX6 which tells you just how remarkable the readout is on the A7S III. Even more surprising, when we slow it down, if I was to give the edge to one of these cameras, it's the FX3 that seems to perform fractionally better. Let's be honest though, there's no way anyone is gonna notice this in a real world setting. Now here's a handheld shot from my shoot just to show you how the movement renders in both cameras. Honestly, I can't tell a difference, can you? All this tells me is that the FX3 displays outstanding technology for a mirrorless camera. Okay, so here's my conclusion. First up, the FX3 versus the A7S3. If you shoot video more than 95% of the time, then I really believe that the FX3 is hands down the most capable mirrorless camera for that purpose on the market. If you shoot stills even 25% of the time, I still believe that the A7S3 is the more suitable camera. I personally find taking professional photos without an EVF really frustrating outside of it being parked on a tripod. Now in terms of the FX3 versus the FX6, if you shoot video professionally, which means you make a living off of it, then I still believe the FX6 is the better camera to have even with the additional investment. There's many reasons for this, not the least of which being that the codec on this has an MXF wrapper which plays really fluidly on my 2019 MacBook Pro, whereas the HEVC codec with the FX3 most often always needs to be transcoded. 
Add to that internal ND, timecode, DCI 4K, user lookup tables, and officially equipped with dual gain ISO, in many professional environments, lacking some of these features is a non-starter. If you're a film student, a wedding shooter, or an independent filmmaker, then the FX3 gives you the most cinema camera experience in a mirrorless form factor. And if you're already on the FX system, like an FX9 or FX6, then the FX3 can be a really good trusted B cam or something that you can say mount to a drone. And that's it guys. I hope you really enjoyed this video and I hope that it helps you decide between these three cameras. And a big shout out and thank you to Sony as well who lent us this camera for a couple weeks ahead of launch. It's a really rare opportunity and we really appreciate it. And that's it. As always guys, please subscribe to this channel for more videos like this and you know, comment in the comment section below because I have a feeling you're gonna have something to say about this camera. So that's it for me. Thank you so much. Peace.